Praise God, my wife and I are so excited to be back here at New Beginnings. We feel like family now, so praise the Lord. You guys are very blessed to attend this church, and not only because you got great praise and worship, but your pastors are amazing, and we have really fallen in love with them, and they teach you the truth, the full word of God, the pure word of God, and we're very honored to be in Pastor Joe and Barbara's pulpit, and we don't take this lightly. Uh, we, we are very blessed and honored. Thank you for having us. <clears throat> On November 23rd, 1998, I had an experience that changed my life. It does not matter if you believe my experience. What matters is that you check out what the Word of God has to say about hell and avoid it just the same. This was not a near-death experience that I had. This was an out-of-body experience that would be classified as a vision in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven in a vision, he said, whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. So in a vision, you can actually travel, like Paul and John actually went to heaven in their spirit bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, talks about a natural body and a spirit body. And in Ezekiel chapter 8, he was picked up by his hair and carried from Babylon to Jerusalem. He was told to eat. He experienced the sweetness of the food in his stomach. He wept. He conversed. My point is, in, in a vision in your spirit body, you can experience the same things that you would in your physical body. It's just as real. And in Job 7.14, it says, you scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. So you can have a terrifying vision. Isaiah 21.2, he was given a grievous vision. And in Job 4.14, Eliphaz was given a vision that caused his bones to shake. So you can have a grievous, terrifying, bone-shaking vision. And this is not to compare my experience with any of the great men of the Bible. I'm just trying to give you a scriptural basis of how this can occur for a Christian. I've been a Christian for 48 years. The only way a Christian can see hell is in a dream or a vision. Okay? And you might say, Bill, but uh, I'm not going to hell. Why do I need to hear about hell? Three quick reasons. Number one, when you understand how severe hell is, you'll be much more appreciative of your own salvation from what he saved you from. Number two, it'll cause us as Christians to walk more in the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 17 says the fear of the Lord is to read his word and to obey his word. That you have enough respect for Almighty God that you obey him. Proverbs 16, 6 says, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So see, the fear of the Lord helps keep you walking the straight walk. You realize there's consequences for your actions, but more importantly, you want to serve God and you don't want to offend him by sinning. So, but the fear of the Lord helps us keep walking that straight walk. And number three, it'll give us all more of a passion for the lost, a desire to want to witness because that's what we're all called to do is open our mouth and many people don't share the gospel. Yet, that's, it'll give you that urgency when you understand how severe hell is, you'll think, man, I don't want my family going there. I don't want my friends going there. <clears throat> I've got to take some extra effort. Maybe you'll pray and fast or something for a family member because now you've got God's heart. You see, he doesn't want one person to go to hell. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11, Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So when you understand judgment in hell in general, you'll be more persuasive with men. <clears throat> and it'll give you that passion and desire. My wife and I went to a prayer meeting that we attended every Sunday night. Nothing unusual about the night. I had never studied the topic of hell at that point. I had never gone to dark movies. I never drank. I've never taken drugs. And I never had a vision before. And I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. And I was walking uh, through our living room, and suddenly I was pulled out of my body like being drawn up out of your body. And I found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel and was getting hotter and hotter. And I entered this open cavern-like area and then I landed on an actual stone floor in a prison cell in hell. I had no idea how I got there or why I was there, but I was fully awake and cognizant, just like I'm standing here now, in this filthy, stinking, dirty, like a dungeon, rough-hewn stone walls and actual bars. But Isaiah 24, 22 says, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. <clears throat> Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. The word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17, 16 says, They shall go down to the bars of the pit. Jonah 2, 6, The earth with her bars is about me forever. And the Tyndale, the New International Commentary, many others point out that Jonah was actually at the gates of hell and it was literal bars and gates. Well, that's where I first found myself, face down on the floor, and the first thing I noticed was the intense heat, far beyond the ability to sustain life. I wondered, how could I be alive in this place? And so my reaction was I wanted to get up and run. 
That's how I felt. But I tried to move, and it took so much effort. I thought, what's wrong with my body? But Isaiah 14, 9, and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. So if you ever had the flu and you felt weak, a thousand times worse than that. Any movement takes tremendous effort in hell. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, In him we live and move and have our being. So even movement comes from God. It's not automatic. I looked up and I saw these two demons in the cell pacing like a vicious caged animal. They had the most ferocious demeanor about them. Uh, reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, a huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws about a foot long. And these particular two were about 12 or 13 feet tall. That's not an exaggeration. I could give you scripture for that, but I'll keep moving. And <clears throat> they were blaspheming God, but we know blasphemy comes from the demonic realm. Revelation 13, 6, James 2, 7, and some others. Then they directed this hatred they had for God, they directed towards me. I wonder why. What have I done to them? But the one demon picked me up, threw me into the wall, the prison cell. I hit the wall. I felt as if bones had broken. I wondered, how could I be alive through this? Why am I not dead? And then the other demon grabbed me and picked me up and dug its claws into my chest and just tore the flesh open. This is actually happening. I couldn't believe this. And I looked. I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And remember Luke 16, the rich man, um, he lifted up his eyes. He had a, a tongue. He wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He had a mouth to speak and so forth. So you have a spirit, your spirit body can withstand these torments in hell. But you do have a body. I noticed there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. It just was dry. But Leviticus 17, 11 says, The life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says, Thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They have an extreme hatred for mankind. But see, Psalms 103, 17 says, The mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell, so you don't derive the benefit of mercy. <clears throat> About this time, it went dark. I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see. And, but then it, he withdrew his light and it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. But Lamentations 3, 6 says, He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Jude 13 mentions blackness of darkness forever. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 30, Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But it wasn't just dark. You could actually feel the darkness. And that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10.21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. Because, I don't know, there's just such wickedness and evil in this place. It just seemed to penetrate through every cell in your body. I was taken out of this prison cell. I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. This pit was about a mile across. I just understood that. With flames raging high up into this open cavern. And it was not metaphorical or allegorical flames. It was real fire. I felt the heat. I saw the flames. But more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Psalms 11, 6 says, Upon the wicked he will rain fire and <clears throat> brimstone and a horrible tempest. Psalms 140, verse 10 says, Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13, 49, The angels shall sever the wicked from the just and cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. Jesus warned about hell in 46 different verses, and 18 of those verses are about the fires of hell. And this is where I could first see people inside this pit. There were thousands of people burning. And it's the most awful sight to see a person on fire. You know, I couldn't distinguish a man from a woman. They look like skeletons with just like flesh hanging off their bones. It was horrible. And the screams were so loud and deafening coming from the people. And thousands of people screaming. You want to get away from that. But you can't. You have to endure that for all eternity. But see, Isaiah 57, 21 says, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There's no peace of mind, no peace of any kind. But see, Isaiah 32, 18 says, my people dwell in a quiet resting place. You're not his people, so you don't derive the benefit of quiet. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to talk to my wife. I understood I'll never get that opportunity, and I'll never see her again. Job 7, 9 says, he that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. You have the understanding that you're not going to get out of this place. And you don't realize what it's like to not have any finality with your family. 
that you can't tell them goodbye. You, you can't let them know that you still exist. And you see, death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You still exist, you're just down deep in the earth. And that's a tormenting thing to not have any finality, not be able to say goodbye to your family. I wanted to talk to a person, just anybody, but you're, den you're denied that. You, even though those people are in the pit of fire, they're all kept at a distance. So nobody's close to each other. You have no conversation. You'll never talk to another soul. You're just in isolation. I understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. I had that understanding. But remember, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation. That infers a lesser damnation. Or Matthew 10, 15, he said, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city, inferring there's a less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10, 28 says, of how much worse of a punishment suppose it shall be for you, you who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. There's a worse punishment. But my point is there is no tolerable level in hell. There is no comfortable level. Any level is far worse than your mind can even conceive. The stench in hell is the most foul, putrid, disgusting odors, worse than any open sewer. And remember, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits. Mark 9, 25, demons have a disgusting odor to them, but also the smell of burning flesh, it smelled like, and the smell of burning sulfur. And if you ever go to Hawaii to the volcano, they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxicity of the sulfur coming up, it will kill you if you breathe it. It's called sulfur dioxide. And uh, it's toxic. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And the word brimstone is all through the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, putrid, disgusting air that you don't want to breathe. But it's even worse than that because there is not enough air to breathe in hell. You can't take a nice deep breath in hell. You can't do that in hell. There's not enough oxygen. You have to fight for even the tiniest bit of air. And only maybe an asthma patient or a fireman could relate to this. But this is how you breathe in hell. It's like... <coughs> that was as much air as you could get. Well, that's not enough. You feel like any moment you're going to suffocate. So you have that ongoing feeling of suffocation. But see, Isaiah 42.5 says, The Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. God is very specific with his word. Uh, you have no purpose, no destiny. It's just a complete useless wasting away. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, There is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. It's just a waste. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here. No one would know who you are there. You have no identity. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says, Your name is covered in darkness. And another thing is you're forgotten in hell. Psalms 88, 12, Isaiah 26, 14, Deuteronomy 32, 26, Psalms 109, 15, explain that you're forgotten. And you don't realize how tormenting that is because you understand nobody up on the earth has given you a thought. You're completely forgotten. I mean, just think, do you think about anybody in hell? No. And even if you go to a funeral today and you're not a Christian, no matter what religion, it's usually stated, well, they've gone to a better place. That's what most people think. Yet Jesus said in Matthew 7, many are going to hell and few are going to heaven. You need to sleep in hell, just like here we need sleep. Well, in hell, you never get to go to sleep. And if you ever stayed up for two nights without sleeping, right, you're, you're pretty much a wreck. After two days, you cannot function. Now, I was only there 23 minutes, but I felt like I was there 23 weeks without going to sleep. You're completely, physically, totally exhausted and desperate for sleep. But you never get to go to sleep. But see, Revelation 14, 10, and 11 says, And they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, that primarily means no rest from the torment, but no rest of any kind. Because Isaiah 57, 20 says, The wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, the sea is always moving. can't stop. That's how you are in hell. You can't rest. But see, rest is a blessing from God. Psalms 127.2 said, The Lord gives His beloved sleep. You're not His beloved. So you don't derive the benefit of sleep. It's a place of confusion. Jeremiah 20.11, Isaiah 45.16 mentioned everlasting confusion. Job 10.22, a land without any order. You know how we like things orderly in life, right? In order, because we serve a God of order. Well, hell is the antithesis. Hectic, crazy, chaotic. Nothing makes any sense in hell. And um, I was standing next to this big pit of fire and demons were shoving people back in. People were burning and they were trying to claw their way out of this pit. 
but they have no physical strength to even claw themselves out, to pull themselves out of the pit. And the demons are shoving them back in. People are screaming and burning. I was standing next to this pit. Now, I have to explain one thing. You know, a pit a mile across here on the earth would produce a lot of light, right? But in hell, it doesn't. The light, I can only see through the flames and along the edges. It's so dark, it consumes the light of the flames. But along the edges, I noticed I was standing beneath a tunnel, a cavern walls that were ascending upward. And all along the cavern walls were demons of all different sizes and shapes. Some were only two and three feet tall. Some were 12 and 13 feet tall. Everything twisted, deformed, and grotesque. The most hideous looking creatures demons are. And there were snakes all along the edges. And I noticed, I looked down, and I was standing on solid maggots. And they were crawling all over everything and everybody. But remember, Jesus said, where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. And he used the word maggot. And then he personalized it by saying their worm. There's personal maggots, people crawling all over everybody. And, uh, you know, I never knew this, but if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, after the maggots consume flesh, the maggots will die. I never realized that, but they die after they consume the flesh. That's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not, because the flesh is never fully consumed in hell. So as Job 24.20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly on thee. Isaiah 14.11 says, where the maggot is spread under thee, and the worm will cover thee. Look it up in the original, it's the word maggot. I know it's disgusting, but I'm just trying to picture, paint you a picture of what the Bible says. You're hungry, you never get to eat. You have the ongoing feeling of hunger. Thirst, remember the rich man Jesus talked about in Luke 16. He wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He was tormented in the flame. Well, if I was to give you a drop of water, that wouldn't suffice, would it? You wouldn't value one drop of water. But in hell you would. You'd do anything for that one drop that you'll never get. The fear that you experience in hell is so far beyond anything you can imagine. Far worse than anything. Most of us, maybe you've gone through some kind of fear in your life. I don't know, whatever you can relate to something you've gone through. I'm going to share with you an experience I had so you can try to get this because right now we're all comfortable. We're not getting this, what it's like to live in fear and terror. And it says, the Bible says, fear has torment. Well, I used to surf a lot when I was a teenager. I was 17 years old, surfing off Cocoa Beach, Florida. There was about 100 guys out that day. We were having a great time, big day. And suddenly, the guy next to me got his leg torn off sharks all over the water and now now there's a frenzy of them and so I got up on my knees to get my legs out of the water and I was on a nine foot board and a shark passed by my board and he was longer than my board and it was a tiger shark if you know anything about tiger sharks they're really vicious they eat anything and the shark came back and bit my board in half now I was swimming in the water my buddy was knocked off his board and he looked at me and said Bill I, I guess we're dead because we're far out off the beach, sharks all around us. And then that big tiger shark, one of them came back and grabbed my leg and pulled me down under the water. Now you can imagine the fear that I felt at that moment. I mean, even though you, you haven't been through it, you can kind of imagine in your mind what that would be like. It's a pretty scary thing. Well, that fear that I felt at that moment paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. It wouldn't even register. But see, Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, you cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terror. You're consumed with this terror for all eternity. But God had mercy on me, and the shark not only opened his mouth and let me go, but I looked and I didn't have a mark in my leg. That's impossible. That was a miracle of God. He was really had mercy on me. And I was not even a Christian then. But I got saved immediately after that. <clears throat> hey, I knew that had to be God did that. So I've dedicated my life to him after that, and I've been serving him ever since. Praise the Lord. We serve a good God, amen? That's right. Now, I just want to take a minute and give you some scripture about being tormented in hell. Uh, because you might say, come on, Bill, aren't you exaggerating a bit? No, I'm just giving you Bible. It's not important you believe my experience. It's important you believe the Word of God. So can you bear with me for a minute while I give you some scripture about being tormented? Okay? Matthew 18, 34 mentions being delivered to the tormentors. Luke 12, 47 says you'll be beaten with many stripes or beaten with few. Who's doing the beating? 
Psalms 50, verse 22, you that forget God, you'll be torn in pieces. Matthew 24, 51, I will cut them in pieces where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Psalms 116, 3, the pains of Sheol have gotten hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Amos 5, 18 and 19, for what good is a day of the Lord to you, judgment day? It'll be darkness, and as a man fled from a lion, and a bear met him. Job 33, 22, his soul draws near to the pit and his life to the destroyers. Psalms 141, 7, their bones are scattered at Sheol's mouth. Psalms 49, 14, their beauty shall consume away in Sheol from their dwelling. <clears throat> Psalms 32, 10, many sorrows shall be to the wicked. Psalm 78, 49, I will cast my wrath upon them by sending evil angels among them. And Deuteronomy 32, 22, for a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with poison of serpents of the dust. One more verse, Psalm 74, 20, says, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty full of the habitations of cruelty. The word cruelty there, if you look it up in the Strong's, in the original, in the Hebrew, it's the word Hamas. We've all heard that word before, right? Hamas. The word Hamas means ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. So for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. Well, that's what you're experiencing in hell. And I say, Bill, why would God make such a horrible place? Well, Jesus said why in Matthew 25, 41. He said, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He never intended for man to go to this place. He prepared it for the devil, but he used the word prepared. And the same word he used in John 14, 2, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven. So he prepared heaven for us, hell for the devil. But it's interesting because, see, James 1, 17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of light. So all the good we enjoy in life comes from God. It's not automatic. The things we enjoy, there, it's good. So what he did in the preparation was he simply withdrew his attributes. God withdrew his goodness or his attributes from hell. See, hell is dark because 1 John 1, 5 said God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1, 4 said God is life. There's only hatred in hell because 1 John 4, 16 said God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 says the mercy of the Lord is in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18.32 said it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11.11 11 says water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9.6 says he is the prince of peace. So see, if God removes himself from the situation, all the good goes with him. You can't separate the two. You can't have the good without God. So if your person in life that says, you know what, I don't want anything to do with God. Well, fine, there's a place prepared that has nothing to do with him. Can you see that? Other than one thing, the fire in hell does represent God's wrath. All through the scripture, it says he will pour out his wrath on sin in the form of fire. But God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross so we wouldn't have to take that wrath. So you can either let Jesus take it or you can take it. It's your choice. As I was looking at all this horror, demons shoving people in the pyre, fire, maggots, I started ascending up this tunnel and it was getting totally black, absolute darkness. And then in this black tunnel, suddenly this bright light appeared. Now I knew immediately who it was. I had no doubt in my mind. I did not see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in a bright, a pure, holy light like no light I have ever seen. And I just called out his name. I said, Jesus. He said, I am. And when he said, I am, I went out. I don't know if I died, passed out. I can only explain it through Revelation 1.16. When John saw him, he said his countenance was bright as the sun, and I fell at his feet as one dead. Well, at his feet, he touched me. When I came to, it hit me so strongly that if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, I would be in that place for all eternity. I was so grateful for the cross. I just wanted to thank him. I, I didn't want to ask him a question. I just, all you want to do is thank him. I just said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for going to the cross for me. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. Thank you for taking me to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, you just want to keep thanking him over and over again. But after a time, thoughts started coming to my mind. And he would answer my thoughts. Psalms 139.2 says he answers our thoughts afar off. And I had eight different thoughts. 
But for time's sake, I'm just going to share two of them with you now. Um, I thought, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit's. He said, you just go and tell them. I said, yes, sir, I'll go. But I have to admit, I complained for seven years after this happened. There was no book then, and I didn't want to share it with anybody, but I shared it with my best friend. And he said, Bill, would you come to my Bible study and share it? And I said, no way. And well, he talked me into it after three months. So I went reluctantly, and I shared it thinking, okay, I'll do this one time. Well, that didn't work out so good, but... <clears throat> But we began getting invited all over the country after that. So for the next seven years, my wife would take her two days off a week in her vacation time, and we would travel around wherever we were invited. We paid our own way. We never took one penny from anybody for seven years. And then after that, the publisher approached us, and they said, would you write a book on this? I said, I'm a realtor. I don't, I'm not a writer, and so forth. But I was happy to write the book because I placed in there over 150 verses that talk about everything I saw in hell is already in the Bible. So I'm just a signpost to point people to the Scripture. That's all that's important for them to believe is the Word of God. But it was not something I was looking to self-promote. But I complained to the Lord for those seven years saying, Lord, I, I feel uncomfortable sharing this. I'm a conservative person. And besides, well, I don't need this. My wife and I had good incomes. We were making a half a million dollars a year. What do I need this for? To travel, pay my own way, and put up with ridicule. And I complained, and the Lord put up with me. And the Lord spoke to me one day and said, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. I felt so convicted. But now, you know, it doesn't matter if I feel uncomfortable at all. Because if one person can come to the light of the scripture and avoid this horrible place, it's worth any uncomfortableness I would ever feel. But you know what? God's given us all something to do. And there are no big shots with God. We all need each other. And each person has a gift from God. So I just encourage you, whatever God's given you, just do it with all your heart. And the second thing is I want to share with you. I thought, Lord, why didn't I know you? Now, I, I didn't explain to you that God blocked it from my mind that I was a Christian. He hid that fact from me. Now, you say, Bill, where's that in the Bible? Luke 24, 16, when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says their eyes were holding that they should not know him. John MacArthur's commentary and Matthew Henry's commentary point out that, quote, they were kept by God from recognizing him. God hid it from their minds, and he hid it from my mind that I was a Christian for this reason. You see, if I was there as a Christian, which I was, but I didn't know, I would have known, praise God, he's getting me out of here, right? I would have known that, but he wanted me to experience what they feel, hopelessness. See, they understand in hell that they'll never, ever get out. Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth, and we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And they have no hope for him because it's too late. None of us know in life here what it's like to be really hopeless. Because even if your situation is so dire and so painful, you can always die to get out of the pain. But seeing how you understand, you can't get out of the pain. You'll never escape this pain. And, and to try to imagine no end to time. You'll never get out. Can you see why this decision is so important? People slough it off and think it's no big deal. They have no idea that one second after they die, it's too late. They'll not get this opportunity to receive Jesus and avoid this horrible place. Now you say, if God is so loving, how could he send a good person to hell? Well, God doesn't send anybody to hell. I'll get to that in a minute. But if you're going to go by the standard of good, then you've got to go by God's standard of good. See, his standard and ours are two different things. James 2.10 says, if we offend his law in one point, we're guilty of all. If we lie once, Revelation 21.8 says, all liars shall have the part in the lake of fire. If we steal one thing, 1 Corinthians 6.9 says, no thief will inherit heaven. If we have one lustful thought, Jesus said that's the same as committing adultery and no adulterer will inherit heaven. Well, that's just three of the Ten Commandments. So if we're going to be judged by that standard, would we be guilty or innocent? We'd all be guilty. There's even a scripture in Proverbs 24, 9 that says, even the thought of foolishness is a sin. If we have one foolish thought, that would exclude us from heaven. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? So none of us can stand before a holy God and say, hey, I'm pretty good, let me in. He's going to say, no, not according to my standard, you're not good. As a matter of fact, Job 15, 16 says, man is so filthy, he drinks iniquity like water. Thank God it's not based on being good. It's based on a relationship with Jesus Christ or else not one of us would be there. 
But you might, might not be convinced yet. You might be like a secular radio talk show host that I was on with. They said, Bill, watch your back with this guy. He does not like Christians. I went on the air and he said, okay, Christian, don't you quote me one Bible verse over my airwaves. I don't want to hear none of that Bible on my airwaves. You got that? I said, okay. And um, I said, okay. Um, he says, I submit to you that you Christians are unreasonable because you don't consider my viewpoint. My viewpoint is just as valid as yours, and I'm a good person. And if your God doesn't let me into heaven, then he's actually guilty of a hate crime. So what do you got to say for yourself, Christian? Well, what do you say? You're live on the air. Well, God gave me an analogy. Thank God. And I said, okay, you think you're a good person. You should be let into heaven. He goes, that's right. I said, okay, say you went and found the most expensive home in the country. You knocked on their door, and you said, oh, excuse me, but I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think the people would say? No, right? You wouldn't expect them to. You have no relationship with them. I said, but you, you go through your whole life. You have nothing to do with God. You deny Jesus as the son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of your life, you have the nerve to come knock on his door, demand to live there because you're a good person. What does good have to do with it? You don't know him. You don't have any relationship with him. See, God offered, I said, God offered to be your father throughout your whole life, but you pushed him away. God offers time and time again, but people push him away and say, I don't want you as my father. See, God is your creator. He's not your father to invite in Jesus as your savior. Then he becomes your father. Now you have the privilege of living in his house. Galatians 3.26, John 1.12, John 8.44, Romans 9, 7 and 8, John 17, 9, all explain that he's your creator. He's not your father to you invite him in. So it's unreasonable to expect to live in someone's house that you don't even know. He says, well, you Christians are narrow-minded. You think you're the only ones that's right. He said, I, I think all roads lead to heaven. That's what I think. I said, well, let me give you another analogy, which God gave me. Thank God. I said, say you invited me over to dinner to your home. And you said, Bill, I want you to go south on Highway 95, turn right at Main Street, go up the hill, you'll come to my house. But that's the only way to get to my house. And I say to you, you know what? I think I'm going to go north on 95. I'm going to get off at Beach Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. That's what I think. Well, you're going to tell me, Bill, you're not going to get to my house. I'm trying to give you clear directions. The same way God gives us clear directions to his house. I think God knows where he lives. All we have to do is follow his clear directions and we will get there. That's not narrow-minded. That's specific. He's given us clear, specific directions on how to get to his house. See, people think God's up there arbitrarily saying, well, this one goes to heaven, this one goes to hell. It's not that way. All of us above the age of accountability are automatically going to hell. John 3, 17 and 18 says we're condemned already because we're born in sin, Psalms 51, 2. So see, that's different than being sent there. We're already going there. That's why Jesus came, was to play on a cross, right in the middle of that road that we're all on. So all we have to do is be humble enough to admit we're sinners, look to the cross, and he'll take us off that road. Amen? This is the clear directions to heaven. John 3.36 says, He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. But he that believes not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. How do you know the Son? Just two verses. Jesus said in Luke 13.3, Unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. What does repent mean? Repent means to agree to turn away from a sinful lifestyle and agree to follow Jesus. It's not enough to mentally assent to the fact and say, yeah, I can believe Jesus is God. I believe that. And go live your own life, do your own thing, and ignore the things of God. That's not repentance. Repentance takes a humble heart to admit, man, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I need a Savior, and I'm willing to turn away from sin and follow Jesus. Now, on your own, you can't resist sin. But when you come to God, he gives you a new heart, a new spirit, a new nature, and he gives us the grace or the ability to stand against the sin. See? So right now, you just have to be willing to turn away. And number two, Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. You have to believe in your own heart and confess him with your own mouth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Now, you want to live at his house? You do it his way. There's only one way. Now, if you say, Bill, I just don't believe that. Well, then I have a verse for you. 
Revelation 21 8 says all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. So there's the warning, which is this is a message of love because he just warned you, if you don't believe his word, you'll end up in the lake of fire. Now that's why you can see why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you because you said, I don't believe the Bible. Your own words convict you and send you to hell. You don't want to do that. Because one second after you die, it'll be too late. You don't get a second chance. And can you imagine? You're on your way to hell and you're thinking, I had the opportunity and I passed it up. See, your soul is the most precious thing you have because it's eternal. You will live in one place or the other. Heaven is not our default destination. There needs to be a purposeful act on our part. Revelation 20.15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God actually has a book. And he's going to look to see if our names are written in his book. The worst words you could ever hear would be him to say, Your name's not here because you chose to push me away. And weepingly, he would have to say, Depart from me into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He wouldn't want to say that. But because he loves man, he gives us that free will to choose. So my question for you to, today is, do you know if your name is written in his book? You need to be certain of this one. You cannot take a chance with your soul. With your head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you say, Bill, I don't know if my name's in his book. I'm not certain, but I like to be certain. Or you might say, Bill, I don't know if I've ever really repented. I mean, I maybe acknowledge Jesus as God, but I never really repented and turned away from a sin. Or you might be someone here that says, you know, I do know better, but I haven't been living right for God. I want to get my life right. Well, today is that opportunity for you to turn and commit your life to Jesus and He will help you. You don't have to clean yourself up first. You just come as you are. He loves you. He's given you this opportunity now. I'm going to ask you at the count of three, for those that would say, Bill, I want my name in his book and I'm willing to repent. I want to get my life right. I'm going to ask you at the count of three to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. I see hands all over. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. God, you want to make sure that the Lord sees your hand because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. One last chance for you, if you're willing to come up, but you got to be willing. God doesn't want to drag anybody up here, but I know he's speaking to your heart. So the last 30 seconds, you're invited to come forward and make a commitment. If you don't, that's your decision. Okay. Praise God. It says all of heaven celebrates over just one soul. Amen. We're going to say a prayer in about 10 seconds. If there's anybody else, make your way down. All right, we're going to say a prayer. And I want all you guys that came forward, I want you to raise your hands. It's kind of like showing an act of surrender to God. Uh, you're giving your life over to Him. And so we're going, to, we're going to say a prayer. You're going to repeat after me, and these words will change your whole eternity. You'll never have to fear hell. And God loves you, and you're going to heaven. So we can all say this prayer out loud, all of us. So just, are you guys ready? All right, repeat after me. Say, Dear God in heaven, I know that I've sinned and I cannot save myself. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for me, that he was crucified, died and was buried, but rose again and lives forevermore. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry. Come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You are the Son of God. 
thank you for going to the cross. Thank you for saving me. And I now confess I'm a born again Christian going to heaven and I will serve you all the days of my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Yes. Praise God. God's so proud of you. Thank you for watching today. We pray this message has impacted and blessed you. New Beginnings Church exists to lead people into a life-changing, spirit-empowered relationship with Jesus Christ. If you'd like to support the vision here at New Beginnings, just head over to our Give page. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you soon.